Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to witness the first reading of Sir Percy's Conquest. It's 1774, and England is bathed in sunshine. The reign of King George III causes contempt and suffering amongst the common people. The rich are getting richer, the poor do not even register. There is crime waves sweeping the common man with tragic consequences and corruption in the king's court. Sir Percy Cavendish is 39, a society man, a man with a conscience, a leader of men. His mission is to confront injustice and fight for a cause that resonates through his soul. He leads a double life, our Percy, and his alias, the Rose of the Valley, only few shall see. You will fall in love with Sir Percy. He is charming, likable, and a man of wit. Please join us on a journey of danger, secrecy, and sovereignty. So Percy's conquest is brought to you by Weak Magic. <laughs> is your wig looking dull? Shine it up with the wig magic. Return to lustrous locks. But wait, that's not all wig magic can do. With our patented magical medicinal herbal properties, wig magic also cures disgusting foot fungus what ails you. Surely you're inclined to purchase this incredible powder now. But wait, just you wait. Add a dash of wig magic to your mug of ale for a great taste and improved prowess in the bedroom. <laughs> Guaranteed to make your love cry, huh? <laughs> Some have dubbed it Wigagra. We aren't at all sure why. You'll look, you'll feel stupendous. Consult your local apothecary if something drops off. <laughs> Sunday, 22nd of May, 1774, and Sir Percy is having a soiree at Wallington Hall in Nottingham. Greetings, fine people. My name is Sir Percy Cavendish. I'm elusive and daring. I would say that I have exquisite taste. That is all me. I'm charmingly graceful, wonderfully attired. I'm a man of wealth in both body and currency. I'm a man of words and poetry. I would never share my alternative to you. Let's say, they seek him here, they seek him there. They seek the elusive roads of the valley everywhere. So Percy took a turn around the drawing room this past Sunday. The most beautiful rose my eyes could see. She spoke so eloquently, her cheeks full of color in the first flush of youth. Is this flower taken? A middle-aged woman leapt to her feet and hung from Sir Percy's forearm. She's my eldest, my kind sir. No more than one score and three. What name do you share? Blenkinsop, kind sir. I would like to meet the Rose's father. I'll send for a carriage at two o'clock on Sunday. Does the Rose have a name? Adelaide, kind sir. Very good. Sir Percy turns to his cousin. Oh, Mary, how are you, dear cousin? I hope you're coping with the change of season. I heard a whisper that Rachel from Beeston has more of an interest in you, dear cousin. Oh, yes, cousin, this is true. I ask you to protect me from this insufferable gentleman. I will do my best to protect you, dear cousin. What brings this opinion of him? I hear he has 7,000 pounds in his purse annually. Oh, Percy, his hygiene is lacking, no teeth to be found held, and refers to his mother as the love of his life. Uh, how could one fall in love with such a hideous man? My dear Mary, stay by my side at all times, walk with a limp, and wick with him with desire. That should deter the beast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Benjamin, Sir Percy's man servant, enters the room. Sir Percy, the evening meal, meal is awaiting you and your guests. Thank you, Benjamin. The evening meal was enjoyed by all. By the time the guests left, it was ten o'clock at night. Benjamin arranged for five of Sir Percy's closest confidants, known as the crew, to meet him in the dining room at eleven o'clock that night. Gentlemen, shall we enjoy a whisky and discussing our next conquest? You've all been briefed about our next conquest and your roles. 
This must remain between ourselves with every conquest. As you're aware, I'm opposed to the public execution of criminals in London. Thousands attend the spectaculars on no less than eight occasions in the calendar year. We need to sabotage such events and raid the coffers of the state. It is shameful that the state should profit from the crimes of the common man. We'll give to the poor and we'll save lives in the process. The judicial system is barbaric and flawed. Law enforcers old and educated, spending a little of their time dressing the crudes, true crimes of the state, being the corruption among the King's Court. I'll go to London in three days with the view of being disguised as the man on the gate of the paddock of hell. Gentlemen, you'll accompany his aides to sabotage the next execution, being held on Monday the 13th of June 1774. We have two weeks to execute our grand plan. Execute may be the wrong choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> Jeb, please provide an update on your role. I have arranged for the crew's accommodation within walking distance of your Kensington residence. As I have travelled extensively in recent times, I have the skills to make incendiary devices to cause maximum chaos on the day. I will speak to Benjamin when I need money for the explosives, I am working on this straight away as we do not have a great amount of time. Marcus, please provide an update. I have commenced the plan to raid the coffers of the court and store the gifts for a later time in the city limits. As it takes two full days to travel to London, we'll meet on Friday. Please record, coordinate with Benjamin regarding the venue and time. We need to plan to the detail. Effectively, we'll be interfaced. Inter so come on, Sir Percy, infiltrate trade the executor's team of men in preparation of the forthcoming executions. We'll provide a barrel of rum for the guards. Whilst on intoxicated, we'll take on those who cooperate and place the unruly ones in the cells. With no papers and identification, they'll be fodder amongst the criminal men and women. We need equipment, costumes and bold intent to carry out our deeds. As per previous missions, gentlemen, no drinking and no women to distract us from our endeavours. Unless you have any direct questions, may the crew unite and have success. Thank you, gentlemen. <coughs> so, this is conquest is also brought to you by the privileged few speaking to you. <laughs> <laughs> you, sir, are you tired of bellowing for your servants across the manor? <laughs> Let us install the latest in gadgetry that your maid or manservant may never again have a moment's peace. <laughs> Valets and butlers may be cunning in avoiding your cries of more tea, more brandy, or simply putting on your best going out wig. But our speaking tube will run from room to room, making you quite brilliantly audible, even in the servants' quarters at four in the morning. It'll cost you a pretty penny, but then you are heir to a great fortune, are you not? Ha! Ha! You are not? What are you bellowing at us for then, you rotten pauper? <clears throat> not guaranteed to be effective if your servants suffer from deafness. For this, we recommend poking the oaf with a sharp stick. <laughs> so Percy is alone in his sitting room, reflecting upon his privilege and obligation to those with less grace. I really see installed the newest form of communication in my country house, Wallington Hall. Both sprung bells and speaking tubes to draw the attention of my servants from every quarter of my personally decorated country home. A touch of grace, if I may say myself. I've carefully and meticulously incorporated a sense of old world with modern Georgian fabrics and furniture. <laughs> I actually think the most officious way of making a difference is to lead by example, and doing random acts of kindness is setting a very good example how to behave in the world. So Percy picks up a speaking tube attached to the wall of the sitting room. Benjamin! Benjamin! Can you hear me? Calling Benjamin! Can Benjamin. you hear me? Benjamin picks up the speaking tube. Yes, Sir Percy, I can hear you quite clearly. How can I be at your service, sir? Benjamin, I would like some club sandwiches and a glass of warm cow's milk. Benjamin, can you hear me? Yes, Sir Percy. You do not need to bellow, sir. I can hear you quite clearly. Benjamin? Uh, Benjamin? Yes, Sir Percy. Has the carriage left to collect 
Mr. Blickensop. Yes, Sir Percy. The estimated time of arrival is two o'clock in the afternoon. Benjamin, Benjamin. Yes, Sir Percy. What are the climatic conditions in the Rose Garden? Benjamin, can you hear me? Yes, Sir Percy. <clears throat> it is comfortable. Uh, wearing a light jacket and a broad-brimmed hat should suffice. I will prepare tea for the gentleman and your good sip. Benjamin, do you recall the name of the rose I spoke fondly of? Ah, yes, sir. It is named Rose of the Valley. No, 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 Benjamin. The young lady in hand, I wish to court you. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, sir. The young lady is named Adelaide. Thank you, Benjamin. That will be all for now. Oh, I do endure this new contraption in which to converse. I'm a clever chappy, if I may say myself. <laughs> he is startled and let out a scream that sounded like a fighting. I hope why no one heard my screech. I need to think about my trip to London this coming Wednesday. No, 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 too much time to think. I know. I'll spend some moment to improve on my collection of quips. Think, Sir Percy. The footwear of a gentleman can cause great distress on wet and ghastly days. Oh, such humour, Sir Percy. You do amuse yourself. Ha, 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 ha. Sir Percy is sitting in the garden. Sir Percy! May I introduce Mr. Blenkinsop? Good afternoon, Mr. Blenkinsop. Let me introduce myself. Sir Percy Cavendish. Welcome to Wellington Hall, the finest home in Nottingham. I hope your journey was comfortable and a safe one. Ah, good afternoon, Sir Cavendish. The journey was most pleasant. Your grounds are kept beautifully. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you, Mr. Blakersop. May I call you William? Oh, of course you may. However, my name is Edmund. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear Edmund. Frightfully sorry for the misunderstanding. My man. Oh, no, 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 no offense. Misunderstandings do occur. May I call you Lewis, Sir Percy? <laughs> oh, Edmund, you're a man of wit. I think we'll just get on fine. <laughs> <laughs> a seat, Edmund? Tea and sandwich? Oh, thank you, uh, Lewis. I mean, sir. Oh, Percy. no more, Edmund. Edmund, did you ever hear the one about the farm boy? Oh, yes, 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 I, I know this one. Um, the wit in this is uh, men. Of our position, never hear about farm boys. <laughs> <laughs> they both laugh so much that Percy's wig fell. <laughs> Benjamin! 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 promptly comes to Sir Percy's aid, his wig is maneuvered into position. Oh, thank you, Benjamin. We must stop. We must converse about your eldest. Well, why should you inquire about my boy Archie, Sir Percy? Stop, 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 Edmund. Oh, 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 you must be inquiring about my dear girl Adelaide. Does this buffoon have a serious side? Yes, I'm inquiring about your daughter Adelaide, Edmund. Your daughter is beautiful. How old is Adelaide and has she ever been committed? Sir Percy, Adelaide is 23 and educated and, uh, no, she is not committed. May I inquire about your good self? What do you inquire about myself? Well, your income, your age, and are you, or have you ever been, committed? <laughs> Many questions, Edmund. I'll do my best to answer them. My income is £21,000 a year, and I have five estates throughout the wider kingdom. My London residency is located in Kensington. I am 39 years old. I have once been committed. I'm a widower of four years now. My dear Elizabeth pa passed a painful death. She was trampled by a horse on the 13th of May, 1770. 
The poor woman lasted two tormenting weeks after the incident. I did not leave her side during this time. I have mourned her each day since her passing. It has been difficult. However, I do believe I can love again. Elizabeth will want that for me. Edmund, I'm awaiting, I'm wanting your approval to court your daughter Adelaide. Uh, Sir Percy, I am overjoyed to accept your request. Do you believe in your heart of hearts of hearts of hearts of hearts? <laughs> if you could love again, raise a family and uh, provide comfort for my daughter Adelaide. My dear Edmund, I'm an honourable man. I'm willing to open my heart again. Support a family and provide comfort for Adelaide and your family. I'm pleased you have consented to our courtship. I will be in London for three long weeks. Upon my return, I'll pay court to your daughter. My dear Edmund, the sun is, jet set to, is due to set for the day. I'll arrange for your transport and return you home. It's been a pleasure to have met you, Edmund. Likewise, Sir Percy. I will discuss our meeting with Adelaide and her mother. The carriage is ready, Sir Percy. Thank you again, Edmund. Safe journey. Good day, Sir Percy. Mr. Blankensop walked through the stagecoach and was driven away. Sir Percy and Benjamin remained in the garden. Benjamin, why didn't you save me from that buffoon, Edmund? Oh, from a distance, it looked like you were both having a good time. Mm. Benjamin, are we set for London in the morning? Yes, Sir Percy, everything is prepared. Is Captain Goddard expecting us tomorrow evening? Yes, Sir Percy. He is a fine man. It's a frightful shame that the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 1763 took his right arm and left him blind in one eye. Those Frenchies and their allies have caused such pain and anguish within the Kingdom of Great Britain. We are blessed that the war did not take his life, as many did succumb. Benjamin, please provide details regarding Captain Goddard, Rebecca and their children. Sir Percy, the captain's four children, Michael, Archibald, Charlotte and Isabel, are well. Rebecca has suffered poor health in recent times, and it is my understanding that she suffers from a skin condition that leaves her in a great amount of pain. Sunlight irritates that condition, leaving her indoors. Well, I do look forward to spending time with our dear friends. And our team, have you heard from them? No, Sir Percy. Oh, which usually means that everything is going to plan. We are scheduled to depart at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, would you consider a bath this evening? Your body odour is vile. I, I, I find it difficult to sit in the same room with you, Sir Percy. And the staff have made comment in recent times. Benjamin, I'm not offended by your comments. Thank you for being frank with me. Do not tell me our guests would have noticed. I do feel ashamed. Yes, Sir Percy, we all notice, but politely refrain from any commentary on the matter. No need to dramatise the issue. It is that time of the year. I have not bathed for two long months. <laughs> I smell worse than a horse's rear end. Or even maybe three. <laughs> Come now, Sir Percy. There's a chill in the air. Come in. Enjoy your whisky while I prepare your bath. Yes, Benjamin. It's been a tiring day. I'll return in early tonight. We have a difficult two-day journey to Kensington ahead of us. So, Percy, your bath is ready. So, Percy is disrobed and enjoyed his bath. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday, 25th of May, 1774. So, Percy was asleep when Benjamin entered the bedroom to wake him. Good morning, Sir Percy. It is seven o'clock in the morning. I have laid your clothes out for you. They are placed on the chaise. Oh, thank you, Benjamin. I feel fresh this morning. A refreshing bath and beauty sleep is what I needed. So much contemplation needs doing, so little time. I was able to think of our, and rest on the journey to the Goddard's homely estate. I have dressed myself and I had breakfast of oats and cow's milk. So Percy stayed in his bedroom and enjoyed his breakfast, talking to himself. Sir Percy, it is time for us to commence our journey. The coachman has prepared the carriage and the horses. So Percy and Benjamin leave Warrington Hall by stage. Aha! We're entering the estate of Captain Goddard. 
Not so grand, but comfortable for a captain of war and his family. I shall enjoy our stay, though only for one night. We'll exchange our horses for the best of the captains and replace them on return from the conquest. Enough time for our black beauties to rest. Sir Percy's conquest is also brought to you by Sir Percy's personalised poems for all occasions. Is there a lady or a gent thou dost, dost wish to woo? <laughs> a much bereaved family member you never held a kind word for, but simply must appease before their will is writ and sealed. A villainous cat you'd like to take down a peg or two with a limerick or a rare Japanese haiku. Uh, or dost thou simply like the word dost? <laughs> Why not try Sir Percy's personalised poems for all occasions? He'll write the ode as only a true bird can, and turn your trials to triumph with his splendid quill. For a price, he'll even do it anonymously, and you may sign your own name to the ditty. <laughs> So Percy made no promises that the poem will not be bent under the influence of strong drink. <laughs> Captain Goddard and his family greet the stage when it stops at the entrance of their abode. Before Sir Percy could straighten his back and crack his neck, he was wrestled to the ground by four hungry and voracious children. Oh, Percy! Oh, this is our mountain! Ah! Percy! Ah! Now, now, children, let Uncle Percy up to his feet. He's had a long journey. You'll have time after our evening meal to converse with him. The maid whisks the children away as Benjamin helps Sir Percy to his feet. Dear Margaret and Rebecca, it's been a pleasure to see you again. It's been no less than four months from our last meeting in London. The children have grown. Michael, my good man, you look well. Yes, Sir Percy. I am well and officially retired from the King's Battalion. <laughs> so Percy greets Rebecca with a bow and a kiss upon her glove. My dear Rebecca, it's a pleasure to greet you again. May I inquire about your health? I understand you suffer pain and anguish. Oh yes, Sir Percy, I've been gravely ill in recent months. However, I have almost returned to good health. Can I offer you refreshments after your journey? Michael and Rebecca, a stiff whiskey or two to settle my nerves. It's been an unsettling day. Welcome to our home, Sir Percy. The <laughs> Percy sat with Michael in his drawing room and enjoyed three stiff whiskies. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, after our meal, we must discuss the forthcoming conquest in London. Were you informed by my man Benjamin? Aye, Sir Percy. I am aware of the conquest ahead of you. May I join your conquest? I am as passionate as you are about the, ju the judicial system in Britain today. The king and his predecessors have been obsessed with conquering other lands and have neglected the people of England. <laughs> <laughs> the level of injustice and barbaric behaviour within the king's court has enraged me. <laughs> Michael, you're not a young man anymore. You need to consider Rebecca and the children. To lose you would have a traumatic, traumatic impact on their lives. I caution you, Michael. Sir Percy, <laughs> you do invigorate me with your youth. I am a healthy 49 years old, <laughs> with a drive and passion for the cause you champion. I am a brilliant strategist and will not be discouraged by you, my man. Michael, you're a stubborn and difficult man. This is why I respect and love you, dear friend. Please be careful in your explanation to Rebecca. The less people know, the greatest chance of success in London. I suggest you only speak of a confidential military strategy with the King's Court. We'll be on assignment for up to three weeks. I'll give you time to speak to Rebecca after the evening meal. I will entertain the children with my wit and shower with them gifts from Nottingham. The maid enters the drawing room. Captain Michael, your evening meal is served. We'll continue our discussions after you speak to Rebecca. So Percy, Michael and Rebecca sit in the dining room and eat the evening meal. The meal was divine, Rebecca. Was that local fowl? It was cooked so beautifully. Michael actually caught it with his only hand. He has a talent, <laughs> he has a talent of distracting the fowl by singing to them. 
much. I think he's singing startles and that they died before him. I like to encourage Michael by congratulating, congratulating him on catching the fowl, but let's hope he does not sing to the cattle. <laughs> <laughs> Now I must spend time with the children. Benjamin, can I have the gifts we spoke fondly of? And Punch and Judy. So Percy and the children went to the nursery at the rear of the house. Once the children were distracted with the new toys, so Percy reflected upon his own youth. I played with the children. I displayed the Punch and Judy show. I created my own dialogue for the performance, keeping in mind the children, their parents, and the estate in which they reside. I have not heard such laughter since I was a child. I may still be, childlike and endearing. Oh, Sir Percy, you do amuse yourself. Ha 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 ha. Rebecca and Mike were into the nursery. Sir Percy, let me take the children off your hands. Too much excitement before bedtime will keep the little ones up all night. I will leave Michael and yourself to discuss your London conquest. Sir Percy, I am overjoyed about the lives that you will, you will have saved. A clever and cunning challenge you and the crew have ahead of you. I bid you a good night. Another whiskey to settle my nerves, Michael? Yes, Sir Percy. I need a whiskey too. So Percy and Michael retired to the drawing room for the long awaited drink and to discuss his role in the conquest. Michael, Michael, my dear Michael, you've put your family in mortal danger by disclosing information to Rebecca. I'm disappointed in you, dear friend. Do you trust Rebecca? Can she keep a secret close to her bosom? It is paramount that she does not put both you and your family in danger. The sharing of information could compromise our whole mission. Percy, Percy, my dear Sir Percy. <laughs> Rebecca is an intelligent woman and very insightful. She knew I was not speaking truthfully about my reason for going to London. I felt compelled to explain to her the real reason for our journey. I merely said that I was accompanying your good self to save some innocent people from death. So it be, Michael. One more whiskey before bed? Aye. So Percy enters the dining room and sits with Michael and Rebecca. Good morning, Michael and Rebecca. I hope you had a pleasant sleep as I did. Good morning, Sir Percy. Good morning, Sir Percy. Benjamin enters the dining room. Benjamin, what time do you anticipate we'll depart in the morning? Oh, Sir Percy, we are packing Captain Goddard's belongings and changing the horses right now. I expect nine o'clock in the morning would be a good time, and it is eight o'clock now. Thank you, Benjamin. I'll take a walk in the garden before we depart. I need to gather myself before the conquest begins in two weeks. Benjamin approaches Sir Percy in the garden. Sir Percy, we are ready to depart for London. Thank you, Benjamin. Sir Percy, Benjamin and the Goddards gather around the stage coach. Goodbye, Rebecca. Be sure that Michael will be safe on our journey. Goodbye, children. Look after your mother for me. Goodbye, Uncle Percy. Bye. 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 The stage coach departs for London. Michael and Benjamin, our mission is, is going to be a difficult one. I wish you both all the safety in the coming weeks. I'm depending on you both for guidance and keep us safe. With my experience, gentlemen, I will be our eyes and ears to the rumble of London during these unstable times. I have contacts and influence within the military and amongst the law-abiding authorities. It will prove extremely valuable. <laughs> You mentioned that King George III has commissioned us to undertake a comprehensive review of the prison infrastructure. I will investigate the gallows, tunnels, conditions, the amount of guards, shift changes, meal times, line of command, and all information that will assist us in our sabotage of the executions. I will take one of the crew to assist me in the investigation, and will report back to the crew in five days to deliver our findings. I shall also report to Benjamin if we encounter any problems. Benjamin, I will need you to provide progress updates on the investigation. I will fulfil my role as Sir Percy, in a, that is, London's pretentious upper class. 
Have you arranged meetings with the good people of the King's Court? Oh, yes, Sir Percy. On Friday night, you're invited to another party to be held by King George III at Buckingham Palace. I've ensured that your days are free. Oh, I do enjoy the King's parties. Drinking, dancing, conversing with the overdressed, pretentious sycophants. <laughs> Little do they know, the rose of the valley is amongst them. I do like to talk about this elusive character. I tease the women by talking about his handsome looks, and the men about his courage, and I'm always questioned about him. Oh, Sir Percy, have you met the daring and elusive Rose of the Valley, they would say. Ha ha ha. The stagecoach arrives at Kensington Palace at four o'clock in the afternoon. The horses are rested and all belongings put in the appropriate bedrooms. Percy and Benjamin speak in the Grand Hall. Benjamin, it's pleasing to be home in Kensington again. Have the staff been alert to our rival? And then we have a special guest that we come for the coming weeks. Well, the staff, the staff, I should say, have been alerted. <laughs> the staff have been alerted, and we have a room prepared for Michael in the North Wing. You will need your privacy. Mm. Are you ready for your whiskey before the evening meal? Oh yes, thank you, Benjamin. <laughs> Please advise Michael he can join me for the meal and the drink in an hour or so. So Percy sits in his parlour and relaxes and reflects in silence as the maids are lighting the candle. If I should say myself, I'm a clever man. The acting classes my mother had me engaged in as a young man of 13 have provided me with skill of characterization. My poor mother passed from the dreaded illness of consumption when I was a mere 16. Her passing had a profound impact on my view of the world. I saw injustice everywhere I glanced. My promise to mother was to help those less fortunate. I know I was born into a family of extreme wealth and standing in the community. I must confess that I do enjoy the fineries a common man could only imagine. However, I do provide direct, I do direct monies to the poor and the ill. My interest in the development of healing aids and the treatment for consumption is my passion. This disease does not discriminate from the wealthy to the poor. I'm becoming emotional thinking about mother and her suffering. Father was a tyrant of a man. He was antisocial and he did not like people. He spent most of his time in the stables, maintaining his horse and riding. I do not think he ever recovered from the passing of mother. We shared our grief and nothing else. He was always say that I was too feminine to grow up to as a respectable society man, passing judgment on those closest to us leads to the stain of humanity. I was always a disappointment to him until his death. I was 22. I carried the weight of his judgment every day. It's horrible to say, but I felt a relief upon his passing. The community we live in could see the embarrassment I was to him. He introduced me as Percy, not his son. I felt like a farmhand in his presence. No need to ponder on these thoughts. They can only make you sad. So Percy is preparing to attend the palace at the King's request. Benjamin, I have to say that my new attire is beautiful. The tailors have impressed me this time. The fabric and cut is astonishing. I will be the pride of the palace tonight. Men will be speechless and the women will try to engage with me. I am a handsome man, if I may say myself. Good pedigree and grooming have made me the man I am today. I'm worthy of any gathering, and I'll enter the fo entertain the folk with my quips and observations. The stagecoach is waiting for you, Sir Percy. Thank you, Benjamin. I will not be late tonight. Sir Percy's conquest is also brought to you by the King's Whiskey. <laughs> to be sure, it's a fine drink for times of stress and kindness. But that's not all this magical elixir can cure. You can pour it on a wound to stave up infection. You can drink it for courage just before an insurrection. You can give it up to voters just before an election. You can dab it on your face for a brighter complexion. You can give it to a lady so she appreciates your affection. <laughs> yes, the king's whiskey will make you feel like a king. 
or a queen, if that is, more your royal seed. <laughs> the king does not actually endorse this strong drink or have any ties to the company, so named in his honor. We'd appreciate it if you didn't mention to him that we're using the royal coat of arms, lest he finds it needful to hang us by the neck. <laughs> So Percy is in the stagecoach travelling to the palace. I had a drop of whiskey on the way to the palace. I needed to settle my nerves. So Percy made a grand exit to the waiting door. Name please, sir! Sir Percy Cavendish. Cavendish, Cunningham, Cotton. Is there a problem, my good man? No! No, sir! The king wanted to greet you personally. Uh, please wait a moment. A small gentleman with a limp darted out of the palace and requested Sir Percy enter and directed him to the drawing room to await the king's greeting. I was left unattended in this beautifully attired room. The fabrics and the furnishing were ex exquisite. I poured myself a whiskey and sat on the shades. It felt like hours, not minutes, that I'd been waiting. The grand doors to the drawing room swung open. The king entered with such grace. He was wearing an exquisite lemon-coloured jacket and matching breeches. King George, my pleasure. The king approaches Sir Percy. Sir Percy Cavendish, it's been too long. <laughs> Thank you for waiting. I have brought you into this sitting room to bring you good news. Tonight, Sir Percy, you will be granted the title of Lord Cavendish of Kensington. This was an unexpected announcement. Sir Percy felt slightly giddy. May I sit, Your Majesty? Oh, Percy, you're, you're one of the finest men in the kingdom, and I bestow this title without hesitation. Do not let us delay your entrance to the Great Hall any longer. The two men embrace, and the king placed a guiding hand. <laughs> a guiding hand in the middle of Sir Percy's back. The doors to the Grand Hall were open. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for King George III and the newly appointed Lord Cavendish of Kensington as a temporal ward. Nominated by King George III and the Honourable Minister William Pitt. Three cheers for Percy! Hip hip! Hurrah! Hip hip! Hurrah! Hip hip! Hurrah! So Percy moved to the centre of the hall to give his acceptance speech. I am honoured to bestow this title. If you wish to discuss my tailor or the finery of Jordan architecture and furnishing. I'm available by appointment. <laughs> oh, Percy, you are such a card. <laughs> On a serious note, I promise to fill my role with the utmost diligence and sobriety. I will refrain from drinking on sitting days of the House of Lords. Though no doubt, there'll be days when we all want to drink. <laughs> I will maintain my position as the best dressed man in England. A quip to finish my acceptance speech. A lord is no closer to God than a cow is in a field of clover. The cow's single mission is to be fed for its slaughter. A lord will be slaughtered based on his attire and his articulation. I don't expect it to be either during my tenure. Many dignitaries congratulated Lord Percy. Your father will be proud of you, Percy. Do the Parliament justice, Percy. I must meet your tailor, Percy. <laughs> Lord Percy considers his new obligations, but the conquest occupies his thoughts even more. I am very grateful for this title. However, my conquest is paramount in my mind at this stage. The team need to execute the challenge with the utmost precision. It is Saturday morning. Benjamin is assisting Sir Percy to dress. Benjamin, help me one in, into one of these disguises that I'll have in London over the coming weeks. For today, I'm a drunkard walking the streets of Kensington, begging for food and money. Sir Percy and Benjamin leave the premises in disguise to walk to the Bloody Stone Hotel in Kensington. Oh, how far do we have to walk? My old body ain't holding up on this walk. And can you hear me, Ben? 
Yes, old timer. Not long ago, there's a public bar not far from here, and we're in the bathroom. Well, I need a drink. My body's drying out. Ooh, here we are, old timer. The Blarney Stone. It's the most respectable bar this side of Kensington. Luckily, we're on the worst side of Kensington, yes. <laughs> Let me open the door for you, Ben. I need a sip drink. Please buy beer for the crew. I understand porter beer is the best choice for thirsty men. Sir Percy and Benjamin enter the hotel. Sir Percy is ushered to the back room, and a please do not disturb sign is placed over the entry door. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to Kensington. I hope our, your accommodations are satisfactory. Benjamin announced to the team that Sir Percy had become a lord overnight. Michael, Jed, John, Marcus, Lewis, and Brendan were all seated in a rather grand table. The crew were all dressed in common clothing and looking rather unwashed. You all will depart, gentlemen. We'll wait for Benjamin, then we'll continue our planning. Benjamin enters the room with enough beer for the eight men. Gentlemen, please provide updates on your part of the conquest. Jeb? Yes, Lord Percy. I have sourced enough explosives to destroy the hanging platforms and to create chaos within the crowd. I am concerned about potential loss of life on the day. I will have to place the explosives on the fringes carefully to minimise injuries and casualties. I will be focused on strategically placing the explosives once the hanging platforms are built. I understand the building begins this Monday. I have infiltrated and become a member of the construction team. They are building five platforms to execute 150 prisoners in a single day. I will report to you and the men in a few days. Thank you, Jeb. I am concerned about the loss of life too. We need to think of our intentions in the conquest. It is to arrest the senseless deaths of petty criminals. I am sure you have the best intentions, Jeb. Brendan and I have commenced a comprehensive review of the holding shells at Newgate Prison. We are all aware of the terrible conditions therein. I have heard from people in government that there will be approximately 150 of the 300 prisoners awaiting death. We have to save lives, gentlemen, and we can redirect them and others away from a life of crime. Our plan is to release the prisoners who are to be executed and those remaining as well. Marcus, please provide an update on the King's loot. We have identified the storage location. It is no more than a five minute walk from here. I have arranged a horse and cart to transport the loot. I have been watching the King's storage over the last two days. The site is not manned after six o'clock on weekdays. It has a small lock on the door which can be broken with little trouble. I will raid the coffers at two o'clock Tuesday morning. I will be taking John and Lewis with me. I don't foresee any trouble at this stage. Thank you, gentlemen. I'll meet the each crew member during the week for progress updates. Over the next, our next scheduled meeting is 11 o'clock in the morning on Friday, the 10th of June, 1774. Good luck, gentlemen. Lord Percy spent the week attending to his public duties with dignitaries and friends. Much whiskey was had. Friday, 10th of June, 1774. An update. Lord Percy and Benjamin walked to the Blarney Stone Hotel to meet once more with the crew. Good morning, gentlemen. I will not take much of your time. We have a lot to do before Monday. Please provide a review of your tasks and highlight any problems or issues that you foresee on the day. Michael, please begin. Well, thank you, Percy. We completed our review of key points of weakness with the prison. The guards are all extremely lazy and disgruntled. We will not take more than a barrel of rum on Sunday night to have all the men in our sleep. They will fully cooperate come Monday morning. The prison officials have divided the general prison population from the condemned and have scheduled 143 executions, 130 men and 13 women. The prisoners will be shuttled to the holding area near the gallows from half past seven. The release of the general population will commence at 11 o'clock sharp, at the same time as the executions. The prisoners will wear civilian clothing so that they will blend into the crowd. And there are four exits in the prison leading away from Newgate and the Old Bailey streets. We'll have access to all of the keys to the external gates 
and do not envisage any issues in the morning, Lord Percy. Thank you, Michael. Jeb, your update on the gallows, explosives in the surrounding area. Thank you, Lord Percy. As previously mentioned, I became part of the team constructing the platforms. There are five platforms, each large enough to hang five people at a time. The mechanisms controlling the drop doors are simple and can be altered with ease. The explosives will be placed in session hats, uh, session sacks under each platform with the fuses set for two minutes. My role on Monday is to be responsible for the maintenance of the platforms to ensure they are in working order. I will be able to move freely amongst the platforms to sabotage and set the fuses. I will have five much smaller explosives placed in the perimeter of the, of the crowd, also in hessian bags. I need five men to light the fuses and evacuate quickly so as not to get caught in the rushing crowd. I also foresee no problems on Monday. Jeff, Benjamin will join your force on Monday. Gentlemen, my role on Monday is to guide the waiting prisoners to the gallows and control the gates. I will have this whistle to commence the process. I'll blow two long whistles to come out and start the commotion. The team put their hands over their ears. <laughs> Finally, Marcus, how did you go with the loot? All went to plan, Percy. We emptied the coffers last week and are in a secure location on the fringes of town. Thank you, Marcus. Could John, Lewis and yourself team up with Jeb on Monday morning? Remember, gentlemen, always use your assumed names and don't communicate unless it's necessary to carry out your duties. Remain professional at all times, evacuate early, return to the accommodation for two days and I'll be in touch. Benjamin, Michael and I'll return to my Kensington residence. I have public duties to attend to after the conquest. Thank you, gentlemen. All the best for our conquest and lead up to Monday. Please lay with Benjamin if you have any queries. Public executions, 11 o'clock Monday morning, the 13th of June, 1774. The conquest commenced on Sunday evening with Michael delivering a barrel of rum to Newgate Prison. Soon word reached every prison guard that the left wing had free run. Take that, cow <laughs> Twenty-five guards were rolling drunk at their mercy. Michael made the drunkards agree to hand over all the keys and follow his instructions in the morning. The guards were paid very little money, usually not enough to eat, let alone taste alcohol. The guards even agreed to follow every command. <coughs> Even the governor became rolling drunk and spoke of his disdain for the guard's condition with wages and the King George's distance from the common man. Who would have thought that a barrel of rum would turn London's main prison over to the Rose of the Valley? As planned, the prisoners scheduled for execution were led 25 at a time to wagons with caged walls drawn by four horses. It would take six trips along the mile stretch of crumbled road to the gallery. In heavy costume and prosthetics, Benjamin and Lord Percy made the slow journey to the gallows on foot at six o'clock in the morning. Benjamin is an amazing dresser. Percy wore a grey wig, pointed chin and a bent nose. The addition of a hunch on his back under his dishevelled clothes made him proud. Again, the rose of the valley had come to London undetected. <laughs> they sick him here. They sick him there. They sick the rulers of Rose of the Valley. Everywhere. <laughs> I'm manning the gates of the paddock of hell. I can smell and taste fear from the prisoners. It makes me a little nauseous. However, relieved I'll be saving lives today. So Percy could see Jen and the men busy placing the sacks of explosives into position and undetected by the executioner and his men. It was a mild Monday morning, a perfect day for courage and freedom. The crowd gathered at eight o'clock, men, women and children sitting and standing in the dusty gallery. Maybe more than 4,000 on them by 10 o'clock. It was going to be a grand day. It is quarter 11 in the morning. 15 minutes until our plan will come to fruition. I could see the men at their postings and Jeb rushing between each pallet platform. The crew are standing at the perimeter with matches in hand, waiting for my call. Jeb is an organised and careful chap. I know everything will go to plan. The Mayor of London made a carefully scripted speech 
which raised a roar within the crowd. Sir Percy had checked his pocket watch, sweaty in his hand. At 11 o'clock, the guards release the prisoners in lots of 25. Sir Percy opens the gate and they are led onto the platforms. Sacks are pulled over their heads and ropes tightened around their heads. It was quiet. Sir Percy heard a baby crying. He believed it to be an ominous sign, thinking dogs and babies can smell death. I blew my whistle under my jacket to set the process. Jeb had gone. I felt ill. I vomited at my feet with the stress and panic that came over me. It was Jeb, my dear friend Jeb. He died a great man, fighting my, for my cause. If only I had... Lord Percy got a gentle arm over his shoulder. It was Benjamin. Come with me, Percy. We must leave. Benjamin was unaware of what Lord Percy had just witnessed. Lord Percy and Benjamin walked away from the calamity and made a direct route to his Kensington residence. They did not speak. Percy is shaking from shock. Lord Percy and Benjamin arrived at the Kensington residence. They walked straight into Lord Percy's parlour. Come on in, Percy. Oh, we both need a stiff drink and tell me what distresses you. I saw Jeb through the crowd under platform five. He wasn't evacuating. I looked closer. The sleeve of his jacket was caught in the locking mechanism of the platform. Oh my God. He was pulling out his jacket. The fuse lit. Jeb! Jeb was kept pulling and pulling at his sleeve of the jacket with no avail. He could not release himself. <coughs> he was trying to remove his jacket, but was cramped underneath the platform. Witnessing Jeb's destiny was the most terrifying experience of my life. Percy had tears running down his face, recounting his horrible experience. My dear friend Jeb was confronted with his impending death. I could still see clearly. My, the tears in my eyes made them cloudy. I had one more concentrated glance at Jeb. He knew he was about to die. He no longer pulled on his sleeve. He fell to his knees and looked in my direction. He made eye contact with me. He smiled. After four full glasses of whiskey, they began to calm down and settle. Benjamin was distraught. He was not a man of emotion, but hearing about Jeff broke him too. <coughs> Percy removed the clothes, wig, nose and chin that he was wearing and asked Benjamin to do the same. Benjamin, it is important that any trace of our involvement in the conquest must be destroyed. Maps of any form of communication. I suggest you have a trusted servant dispose of everything far away from here preferably on the other side of London. I need to be washed and dressed as soon as possible. I envision the King will want to call on both tiers of Parliament to discuss what occurred today. I best be ready for the calling. Percy, Michael has just arrived through the servants' quarters. He is alive and well. Benjamin, please have him dispose of everything as we just discussed. I will meet him after our main meal. Lord Percy, Michael and Benjamin ate the evening meal together and spoke fondly of their friend Jeb. They went their separate ways after the meal. Lord Percy spent the next few days resting in London, arranging to return to Nottingham for the summer. 
My mission in London is now complete. The word on the streets of old London town was one of complete chaos and disbelief. The public were joyous, and the government were looking for someone to take responsibility. I sent my signature Rose of the Valley to the King and the Prime Minister as a gesture of my wit and Victoria's conquest. They sick him here, they sick him there. They sick the elusive roads of the valley everywhere. <laughs> oh, Sir Percy, oh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I really can't laugh at the moment. Although, I know Jeb would want us to mourn, but to celebrate his life. One final time, Lord Percy, Michael and Benjamin made the journey to the Blarneystone Hotel. Gentlemen, this is our last meeting of the crew before I leave on Thursday morning. The men all spoke and had a quiet moment to reflect on the passing of Jeb. Men, be strong and remember Jeb. Jeb is a kind and gentle man. I'll be breaking the terrible news to Jeb's wife and family. I'll spend time consoling and supporting them at this difficult time. Your reward for your contribution is £300. This pays for your efforts in arranging a successful conquest and saving many lives. The money will go a long way to ensure you and your family have a comfortable life. Marcus, please spread the word in the front bar regarding the King's loot and its location. They left Kensington with celebration and sorrow in their hearts. Michael, Benjamin and Lord Percy had a peaceful journey to the Marcus estate. They rested, dined and talked about their conquest. They went to bed early that evening to refresh their scattered thoughts. Six o'clock Friday morning, the 17th of June, 1774. Benjamin woke Lord Percy ready for their departure to Nottingham. They both said their goodbyes, laughed with the children, and departed. I was woken by a stagecoach coming to a grinding halt. I could hear men shouting. Many have warned me about the highwaymen on this stretch of road, but I'd never encountered them before. Stay here, Percy. I will talk to them. <coughs> Good afternoon, gentlemen. How can we help you? Give us all your money and possessions. Oh, we don't want any trouble, gentlemen. I have a dead man's body in the carriage. With, with this heat, he's starting to smell. You may have a look at him if you wish. Ah, nah. Keep, keep your smelly body and possessions to yourselves. We will take your horses. Oh, if you want our horses, you'll have to fight my driver and myself for them. I am the smartest swordsman in all the land, gentlemen. Do you want to challenge me? Oh, I will! <laughs> Benjamin withdrew his sword and plunged it into the fire behind him. He screamed and fell on his own ah! ah! his left hand. There was shouting and screaming from the highwayman. One of the men plunged his sword into Benjamin's right shoulder oh! and him to the ground. The men fled, leaving one of their own behind, bleeding and close to death. So Percy, witnessing as he leaps from the stagecoach. A leap from the stagecoach to Benjamin's aid. He's losing a lot of blood in such pain. I turn the shirt. I tear the tear. Let try that again. I tear the shirt from him and press over the wound. The bleeding appears to stop. I retrieve a bottle of whiskey from the stagecoach and pour it over the wound. Sweep from the bottle until the pain is settled. It's not life-threatening. Yes, Percy. You need to rest, Benjamin. The ancient highwayman is close to death. I put two tourniquets on his wrist and one above his thigh. This should arrest the bleeding until we arrive in Nottingham. He may not survive the journey. <coughs> a more vengeful individual would have finished off our wounded assailant and left him in a ditch. I, however, am a compassionate man and a fellow who fought for, with Benjamin's is eager to, to the demise of the pompous and wealthy class as I am. The driver helped them place the man on the roof and Benjamin inside the stagecoach for Sir Percy to nurse. They were only an hour away from Nottingham. The stagecoach arrived in Nottingham at Wallington Hall at three o'clock in the afternoon. Mary, the estate nurse, tended the wounded men on board. She saved the highwayman. Benjamin was put in a sling and was expected to make a full recovery. Lord Percy reflects on the events of the last three weeks in his parlour. Now it's time for me to sit in my parlour to drink and reflect on our journey. I stayed remarkably calm today. I know the shock will have me unwell for a few days. 
What I mean by unwell is what I refer to my black bear. I've had the black bear all my life, a sadness that would not go. Mother would stay with me until I improved. Father would be, make derogatory comments and say that I was too feminine and how mothers should stop encouraging my behaviour. I became extremely sad and stayed in bed for days. At this time, I need to stay strong. Benjamin assigned a manservant to attend me and arrange for my affairs whilst he recovered. So Percy's conquest is also brought to you by A.A. Aristocrats Anonymous. <laughs> As the splendid life of a gent got you down, <laughs> the endless entertainment. Oh yes, lady blah de blah, it really is a divine soiree. I do feel amused. <laughs> Have you lately found the king's whiskey to be your most oft-taken breakfast dish? <laughs> Here at Aristocrats Anonymous, we have bugger all idea how you feel, but we'll take your coin purse, nevertheless. <laughs> our facility may look like a boggy marsh because, well, our facility is a boggy marsh. <laughs> Let us lead you away from temptation and into some mud. We'll dry you out even as the damp creeps into your bones. Fancy a spanking while you're at it, Lord Watson? Happy to oblige. Sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind, and my, haven't you just been a wee bit kind to yourself of late? <laughs> Aristocrats Anonymous is an affiliate of the Church of England, so you Roman Catholics can bugger up and get your own boggy mouth. Off with you, I say. <laughs> Lord Percy sits in his parlour, conversing with the acting man servant, Lewis. Lord Percy! I'm Lewis, your manservant, until Benjamin recovers. Please sit down, Lewis. Listen to my instructions, and we'll do it just fine. Firstly, I want you to arrange a stagecoach to be ready at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. I'm taking a trip to the family of our friend dear Jeb. You have met Jeb on many occasions. He lives... Oh, I'm sorry. He lived no more than five miles from here. Secondly, please take this envelope and have a courier deliver it to the Blickenstop estate, you will find that Benjamin has addressed on file. <coughs> the envelope was addressed to Mr Blickenstop. I wrote a small note asking if I could visit on Saturday to meet Adelaide and the family. Finally, could you please inquire if the evening meal is ready? You could use my talking tube to contact the kitchen. <laughs> it is Friday morning. Lord Percy will be breaking the sad news of Jess passing. I woke at nine o'clock in the morning. Lewis had laid out my clothes. I have not been looking forward to the journey to Jeb's wife, Beatrice, and the family. Such sombre message I will deliver. I feel slightly nauseous. The anxiety is overwhelming. Lewis retrieved 400 pounds from my safe to give to Beatrice. Uh, Lord Percy, the stagecoach is ready for you. I do not usually drink whiskey in the morning. Today, I drank two stiff whiskies on the journey. Lord Percy's stagecoach arrives at the residence of German wife's family. We have arrived. One more deep breath to settle my constitution before exiting the stagecoach. Beatrice is waiting at the entrance of their home. Percy, what a wonderful surprise. What brings you here today? My dear Beatrice, I'm a bearer of bad news. May we go inside? Percy, you look unwell. Is everything okay? They sat down in a small room off the main entrance. Beatrice, you're aware of our undertaking in London in the past three weeks. Jeb is, was crucial to the success of the mission. I'm afraid I'm the bearer of terrible and sad news. Jeb was... A figure suddenly appears in the doorway. Percy! Percy! Wake up! Please, get him a damp cloth. Percy! Percy! Wake up! He's opening his eyes. Am I seeing a ghost? Or have I finally gone mad? <laughs> it's me, Jeb, Percy. I survived the explosion. I'm alive, Percy, and you fainted with the shock of seeing me again. 
I thought you were dead, my dear friend. How did you survive? I had the sleeve of my jacket off and the locking mechanism of the platform. I knew there was no hope of freeing myself. I thought I saw my death. The explosive was at my feet. I had enough room to take up a swift kick at the explosive out from under the platform. Oh, the kick was so great it landed ten feet from me. But the explosion had such force, I hit my head on a beam of the platform structure. I was knocked unconscious. I awake confused and could not remember where I was or where I was staying. I had the Nottingham address in my trouser pocket and I was helped by a kind gentleman who arranged for my transport home. I have been resting for the last few days. I have a bad headache, but thankfully my memory is returning. My dear Jeb, I cannot tell you how relieved I am that you are alive. He handed Jeb an envelope containing his rewards for his role in the conquest. Jeb read the note inside. Oh, I'm confused. This note is addressed to Edmund Blenkinsop, asking for an engagement with his daughter Adelaide. I don't think this note is for me. I am so embarrassed, Jeb. I have a young boy relieving Benjamin whilst he recovers. The boy has given me the wrong envelope. That means your rewards are on the way to Edmund Blickensop. What an absolute disaster. Oh, not all that bad, Percy. I am alive and you are courting again. <laughs> <laughs> Percy promptly left and asked the driver to go directly to the Blickensop's estate to mend the situation. Oh, my nerves. My nerves are shaken. Compose yourself, Percy. A whiskey on the journey will settle me. I believe all will work out perfectly fine until I explain the error to Edmund. He a, has a wonderful sense of humour. In good time we arrived. I do not want to leave the stagecoach. Compose yourself, Percy. Breathe. Breathe. The stagecoach arrived at the Blankens of the state. Edmund greeted Lord Percy at the entrance of his stately home. No, no, no. Percy, 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 what a pleasant surprise. <laughs> we were not uh, expecting you. Thank you for your good money, kind sir. <laughs> oh, dear Edmund, the boy sent the wrong envelope to you. Please read the intended note to yourself. Oh. Oh, Sir, Sir Percy, please, please come and meet my family. Edmund escorted Percy into the home. They walked down the grand hallway to the sitting room. Edmund, your home is beautiful, wonderfully decorated. Oh, I'm much obliged, Sir Percy. Please, uh, come meet my family. Allow me to uh, introduce you. Uh, you've met my wife, Mrs. Blenkinsop. My daughters, Madeline and Harriet, both very accomplished young women, and of course, my eldest, Archie. Oh, and um, yes, you, you know Adelaide. Good afternoon, everyone. Good day. Good day. <laughs> Did I mention I became a lord? A little pretentious, if I may say. Oh, congratulations, Lord Percy. I understand you have spent time with um, Adelaide. Archie, please chaperone Lord Percy and Adelaide in the stroll through the gardens. Watch Lord Percy. He is a sly dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop, Father. You're embarrassing me. Adelaide. Shall we go for a walk on this beautiful day? Lord Percy and Adelaide entered the gardens, with Archie giving them distance to converse. Adelaide, your father is an honourable man. He is very humorous. Does he have a serious side? Oh, Lord Percy, he's a jolly man who enjoys life immensely. We rarely see his serious side. I do know his business of managing the estate is commendable. He's a very loving man, very supportive. He has ensured that we are all educated and have the best opportunities available. Archie has his own law practice here in Nottingham, and the girls are very happy. You speak fondly of him. That is admirable. I know a little about you, Adelaide. Please tell me your passions on this beautiful day. Oh, Lord, oh Lord Percy, where do I start? 
I do love nature, the study of the human condition, and walking to the village daily. I also enjoy playing the piano and reading. We have a most enjoyable life here in Nottingham. One day I would like to travel to Europe with a man of my dreams. I share your interests and passions. I hope we'll become friends. Oh, I do enjoy reading Shakespeare's sonnets and plays. Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet are my favourites. I also write poetry and quips to fill my quiet moments. Adelaide, a citation from Romeo and Juliet. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or, if thou wilt not, be sworn my love. And I'll no longer be capulous. Oh, another citation from Hamlet. Doubt thou the stars are fire. Doubt that the sun doth move. Doth truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. Oh, Lord Percy, such romantic words. Adelaide, may I return tomorrow to continue our conversation? I would love that. Please do come back tomorrow. Lord Percy returned the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and many days after. They walked alone through the gardens. Dear Adelaide, I did not sleep a wink last night. You occupied my mind, heart, and soul. They were holding hands under the canopy of Adelaide's favorite oak tree. <laughs> Lord Percy knelt on one knee in front of Adelaide. Will you marry me, Adelaide? I promise to protect and honor you for the rest of my life, as you are truly beautiful. Oh, Percy, of course I will. I'll be yours forever. Lord Percy put a ring on her finger. <laughs> oh, how beautiful. There is plenty more to come your way. <laughs> I will spoil you, Adelaide, and we'll have the grandest wedding in all the kingdom. I love you, Percy. Oh, I love you, Adelaide. You have been listening to Sir Percy's Conquest, brought to you by Wing Magic, a privileged student speaking to you, AA Aristocrats Anonymous, and the King's Whiskey. Sir Percy's Conquest starred Eddie Berger as Marcus. Sandy Kuhar as Edmund Blankensoft. And the manager of the Gerard Lewis Fitzgerald as the manager of the Tina Valera as Rebecca Glover. Sir Percy Cavendish was played by Marty Monster. Sir Peter Spock for announcement by Mr. Steve Smart.
Thanks, Brandon. 